We are going to move in this order uh, to Kate, Claire, and then Deborah. So next is Kate Walsh. Kate serves as the president of the National Council on Teacher Quality. She has assumed this role since 2002, and she has a very extensive and varied background in other areas. Uh, she's been involved with the Baltimore City Schools, Core Knowledge Foundation, and uh, crossing a lot of her um, involvements has been a primary focus on the needs of children who are disadvantaged by poverty and race. Um, she has lived in Baltimore for a long time and started the first alternative certification program for teachers in Maryland. And this has led to her strong interest in teacher quality. She's authored many papers on teacher quality with a particular interest in the impact of policies and practices of institutions, including states, unions, districts, teacher preparation programs, and the teaching profession. Kate Walsh. If I turn this on, um, so I'm going to jump right in, so we don't, we don't uh, use much more time. Um, so I'm going to go through five uh, things today, uh, talking about what the problem is NCTQ is trying to address, um, and then explaining a little bit about the disconnect between higher ed and um, PK to 12 education. Um, there's a lot more on that issue in your folder today if you want to read something I wrote about that issue precisely. And um, I'm not going to spend too much time on what NCTQ has learned um, because uh, I think that basically most people in the room are familiar with what we learned. Um, and then talk a little bit about um, the issues that I believe Michael alluded to were raising concerns about the NCTQ effort and then what we're doing next. Um, just um, to bring home the problem, um, there are a million and a half kids who are being taught by first-year teachers. So um, the notion that we, this nation can afford to let that year go to waste um, is, uh, is questionable, given the numbers of kids who are in front of first-year teachers. And if you look very quickly here and see the first-year learning loss that takes place, the, very, the high um, dotted line represents first year teachers compared to just second and third year teachers. And you can see they um, fall um, very much to the left of the average distribution of second and third year teachers. So uh, the, the learning loss is significant and it's something we need to attend to instead of accepting the fact that um, teacher the first year of teaching is trial by fire, which that is the um, approach we're taking right now. Um, and then if you look at issues relating to closing the achievement cap. Um, there are great teachers who are able to uh, add a year and a half's worth of learning gains compared to very weak teachers that only add half a year's worth of learning gains. But the odds of getting that really great teacher um, is only one in seven in any given year, okay? So um, we know that we can close the achievement gap. That's the good news if we get those teachers in front of really poor kids. Um, if they get them year in and year out, but to do it takes multiple years. So um, the odds of having a teacher five years in a row, which is what we need to close the achievement gap, is one in 17,000. So that's the challenge, and that's, those are the issues that NCTQ is trying to address. Um, now, here's what I believe is, uh, is the most problematic issue before us, and um, that is very much that the evidence about what teacher prep adds um, is in fact very much available and it's something we've had for years and decades and there's been very little data that suggests otherwise that when um, teachers go through uh, two or three years of training um, they're not necessarily any more effective than teachers who uh, are go through fast track now you can respond to this data in two ways. You can say, okay, then let's just get Teach for America and other alternative route teachers into the classroom. And that was the way I responded to this kind of data 10 years ago. Um, I think it's a call to action on the part of teacher prep that you should not be content with spending a couple of years of your life and a lot of money to go um, into a program to get prepared and then you come out and you're no more prepared than people who have had almost no training. That's kind of shocking. 
So we very much believe that uh, if we re-envision what teacher preparation looked like and we made it much more attentive to the needs of first-year teachers, that we could change this and that teachers who go through these programs uh, would be immediately more effective than teachers who haven't and that nobody in their right mind would ever say, let me hire a Teach for America teacher, because it would be so clear that um, someone who has gone through two years of training is um, measurably better, okay? So um, uh, why, is it that, why is it then that teacher preparation is not adding the value we want? And this is what we've come to believe. First of all, um, the field's ungovernable. And I don't think anyone um, who's familiar with teacher preparation would disagree with us. Um, you know, there's 1,450 higher education institutions that are providing these, um, they're, they're housing these programs. And each one of these institutions has one to seven programs. And, there, and what I didn't appreciate until we actually started rating these programs, individual programs, is how immensely different they are from one another. There is no talking in between the secondary program at the graduate level and the secondary program at the undergrad. Everybody gets to do what they want, okay? And this is compounded by the, field, the field's embracing of academic freedom. The field has yet to accept that there are certain core principles, such as in reading instruction and um, how to teach elementary math. So every professor gets to do what he or she pleases, and no one really questions. And that's supposed to be the balance on academic freedom. You're supposed to be able to say, um, your peers are supposed to be able to say to you, you know what, you're teaching faulty methods for bridge building. You are not allowed to teach faulty methods for bridge building because people are going to die. Well, we have the same, we don't have the same response in teacher ed. We need to be able to say, you know what, you're teaching the wrong methods of reading instruction. There are children who are not going to be able to read because of the way you're teaching it. And that's just not happening in this field. And um, this is not just an external critic pointing this out. If you look at the number of institutions that aren't even accredited, I can't find another profession where only half the institutions are accredited. That's not true in any other field. You're not allowed to operate if you're not accredited. But in this field, half the institutions are not accredited. Okay. The other problem in teacher preparation is that there's, there, the goals in higher ed are so different from the goals of public school educators. Um, they are very, um, first of all, they're hard to pin down. Um, they're much more theoretical in, in nature. They use a lot of words I don't understand. And I'm not a stupid person, but I don't understand what is going on. Um, to form a teacher's professional identity, um, to launch the candidate on a lifetime path of learning, that's as opposed to making sure that they have had the skills and knowledge to be successful in the moment they uh, reach a classroom. We don't expect them to be as successful as they will be in two or three years but we expect a level of basic competence, and we believe that's eminently achievable, okay? Um, one thing that we've noticed as we've gone through thousands and thousands and thousands of courses is that the number one approach to teacher preparation in the United States is to tell the 21-year-old that you're gonna develop your own approach. You're gonna be your own, you're gonna develop your own philosophy of teaching reading, you're gonna develop your own philosophy of doing, managing a classroom, and not only that, but we're not gonna give you the benefit of the knowledge and research and experience of others before you, because that might prejudice you. Now, I'm speaking a little bit in extremes, but not that far from extremes. This is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing over and over again that teachers who are in reading classes are told that you will develop your own approach to reading as if a 21-year-old could begin to compare to the 50 years of comprehensive research we have before us that tells how we ought to be teaching reading, okay? So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to bridge this divide between higher ed and, public's, um, higher ed and public school needs. And our standards very much are um, um, oriented towards the needs of public schools. Um, you can go online, our 18 standards are there. They, can, they include both input and output data. Unfortunately, there's very little output data yet available, but as it becomes available, we'll be using more of it. Um, we look at the um, selectivity of programs, um, subject area preparation, how much practice teaching there is, and the outcomes. Okay, and very briefly, what we found um, it was not good news, but everyone in this room knows about it and, heard, and, and has heard about it, that 78% um, of the programs are not only just average, they're weak or um, they absolutely failed all of our standards. 
Um, if you look at early reading, only 15% of programs are even mentioning in two lectures and providing an assignment on the basic components of scientifically based reading research. We compared elementary math instruction to what goes on in other countries which have higher performance. Again, only 13%. Um, our teachers going to be ready to teach the elementary content they need to be to, for college and career readiness standards, only 10%. Student teaching, this is so basic. Well, all we said was, do you require your student teachers to be placed in a classroom that is taught by an effective teacher? Only 7% of the programs even communicate that requirement to school districts. Um, very big issue for all of us is the selectivity of teacher preparation programs. Only about a third are adequately selective. And believe me, we weren't looking for Harvard grads. We were looking entirely for, are you taking the upper half of college attendees? And only, half, uh, only a third require that. Um, so uh, Michael already alluded to the fact that our theory of change, and this is very hard to read. I cannot begin to read this. I think it's a messed up slide, but um, basically uh, we are looking to provide a consumer tool to uh, aspiring um, teachers and to school districts, but we're also trying to um, change state policies and to help provide assistance to programs. Um, how much time do I have left? I'm out. You have. Okay. So I'm talking fast. I hope that's okay. Um, myth busting. Um, no, I can't read my own slides. What's the first one? Uh, we're out to destroy teacher prep. Um, the field has every reason to be skeptical of Kate Walsh and um, NCTQ on this point. They, they, can, they can uncover all sorts of papers I've written that are very, very critical teacher prep. But the fact is that um, I, I have had my own journey on what I believe is uh, possible here. And now I have gone from being very much opposed to teacher preparation as necessary to being to believing in its uh, a vision that it can be eminently helpful to all teachers, no matter whether they're smart or not so smart, um, that everybody should have that two or three years of training. If you just look at uh, uh, elementary reading and um, elementary math alone, uh, if you look at the amount of coursework and content that needs to be covered, you can't help but reach that conclusion. Um, so Teach for America has solved some part of the problem here. They've shown us what's possible, but they have not shown us, and they've acknowledged that this week by saying that they're gonna start um, putting their juniors into, um, junior uh, applicants into a one-year training. Um, our methodology is flawed. I think we'll probably get into that in the question and answer period. Um, I have answered over and over again that NCT Hughes uh, looks at syllabi as one of 13 different, um, 13 different sources of data. Um, the, somehow these syllabi mean things for the department chairs, for accrediting bodies, for states, but somehow the reason that NCTQ is using them, all of a sudden they don't mean anything. So um, uh, we question that. Um, um, there's also, uh, oh, let's see, I'm trying to, what's that one? Oh, is the third one input? Okay, we do include outputs, already alluded to that. We just need more state data, and we're trying to get to that point. There are all sorts of problems with using VAM data, um, and we've written a paper about that that's getting pretty little attention. I need to find ways to get that a little bit more public, but um, they're definitely, um, we're trying to look at outputs. And uh, we need too many, oh, made too many errors. Uh, less than 0.04% of what was turned into us. Um, I think it's a problematic for the field to say we made a lot of mistakes. Um, and then um, we've uh, reviewed everything. We less, made less than 0.04% on 16,000 ratings. Um, they'll say, well, we didn't bother responding because we don't trust you. Well, uh, we, made our, uh, we made our appeals process absolutely public. You can see if NCTQ is being fair. Every single de decision we made is posted. Every objection by the institution is posted. So if we're being unfair, uh, it's um, incumbent upon um, the colleges of teacher education to show that we're being unfair. And that, has not, that case has not been made. OK, well, we'll skip a little X's. OK. Coming up, um, the next review is coming out in a few months, um, much to my nervous anxiety. Um, we're going to increase the number of institutions by a third. Um, we're moving to a rating system, so it's uh, easier to communicate to the public. It's more user-friendly. Um, we're evaluating programs on um, some more additional standards. 
and uh, we're adding um, programs. This is actually coming out a month after the review on their rigor. I'll show you very quickly what we're, sh what we're seeing over and over again is how easy it is to become a teacher. So this is research that led us to do what we're doing. Um, you look at an education major on the same campus, the average GPA is about 3.9, and every other major that was looked at falls in the 2.7 to 3.1 area. So what is going on in education that it's the easiest uh, major, it's the easiest program to get into, and then when you're in there, you're almost assured of an A, okay? So there, did I do it? 15 you did minutes? It. Okay, thank you. Oh, wow. Well, okay. <laughs> I talked so okay. fast. I'm oh, sorry. Just good. Um, thank you, Kate. And again, in